Good morning, Eastside. Man, it has been, it's been a minute since I've been around, and man, I've missed you guys. Like, I have, uh, just driving here this morning, I was like, I got excited. I was like, I cannot wait to see all the familiar faces that I've spent so many years around. But can I tell you something about this message today? It's been really heavy on my heart. And, I, and as, as I was praying, Lord, what, what do you want me to say? I, I begin to think of, about so many things that the people are going through in this room. Some are going through uh, just disease in the body, and some are getting recoveries from wrecks. Others have loss in the family, and, I, and, I, and I'm very sensitive to that, and I want to in, simply encourage, uplift, and strengthen you guys today. So why don't we just pray and get into it, shall we? All right. Lord, we love you, and we thank you, God. Lord, would you be with me as I bring your word? Lord, get me out of the way. Lord, would you uplift people today, encourage them, and strengthen them? Would you remind them that you are in control and that you understand what we're going through today? Lord, I love you, and I praise your name. Amen. Does anyone in the room just feel fed up? Like, life is great when it's great, but life really is not fun when it's not. Like, it's like, it's so bad sometimes. And sometimes you get to this point where you're just like, I'm done. I just, I'm exhausted. I'm wore out. I've come with my questions to God asking him, why? Where are you? How are you going to work this out? And, and all this stuff, are you even good, Lord? Where are you? Maybe even some of you in the room ask the question, God, are you even real? Have you been there before? I know I have. I'm no stranger to asking hard questions to God. And if you know my story, you know it, you know it well. Then when I was about 13, 14, I was asking these questions, and God seemed to be silent. But then one day, I heard his voice more clearly than I ever have before. Right? So we, so we ask these questions, and, and, and it just gets insane. And sometimes we think we're so isolated that we're the only ones in the room that feel that way. Can I tell you today that that's not the case? You, you can probably raise your hand if you wanted to, and people in, you look around, and other people would feel the same way. And not only people in this room, but there's people in Scripture that have felt very similar to you. And I want to talk about that today with you guys. The first person we'll look at is David in, chapter, in Psalms chapter 69. We'll start in verse 1. So if you want to turn there with me, go ahead. I think it might be on the screen in the back. But it says this, and remember David at this point is just fed up like some people in this room today. He's done, he's been through enough, he's asking God to help. So he says this, For the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, the floods sweep over me. I am weary with crying out. My throat is parched and my eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. Now, upon hearing that, do you, do you guys, some of you feel relieved that, like, I'm not the only one. Like, does, does anyone relate to the fact that the floods are coming up to my neck? Like, you, you started swimming at one point, and, and some trials and tribulations and suffering started occurring, but you're like, I can do it. I can swim. I can go. And then after a while, the, the, the waves got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then what you thought at first, you were like, I'm an Olympian, an Olympian swimmer, and I can got this, but now you look like a wet rat. Because you're just, you're just drowning almost, and you're just tired? Well, David understands. And I love what he says, my throat is parched. When I was going through the season of life where I was questioning God about who he is, is he good, is he real, what's going on, I could feel that I was just tired, and my throat was just tired of asking the questions. Right? But see, uh, but see we, we, we go here, and I want to encourage you, you guys today that we have an understanding God. In fact, that's the big idea for the day. Christ understands. And, and, and this all culminates in a picture of Jesus, and that's the next person we're going to look at is Jesus. So if you want to flip to Luke chapter 22, verse 41, we'll start there. But, but before that, I want to read this to you. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us come with confidence and draw near to the throne room of grace, that we might receive mercy and find grace in our time of need. 
What is the scripture saying? That Jesus Christ himself can sympathize. He understands. My friends, he walked on this earth. It wasn't a different planet that he walked on. No, it was this earth. And, and he, he understands what it means to suffer. He understands what it is. So if you're going through suffering today, know that we serve a God who did the same. So let's look at this picture and this moment and, 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 and Jesus is where all the prophets are kind of prophesying about and Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22. And he is, uh, he's just, you know, went from the Last Supper and so he's hanging out with his guys and, and then one leaves to go betray him and so then he's like, I got to go pray because he knows what's about to take place. So he gets in this garden and he prays this. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Like, Jesus doesn't want to suffer. Like, he is at this point, he's like, hey, God, huh, I don't want to do this. Like, take it away from me. Like, don't, we, that's so relatable to me. He's like, I was like, I don't want to go through what you're going to have me go through. Take it away. But yet, watch what he does next. He submits to the will of the Father. Even though he knows what's coming. See, but just because he submitted to the will of the Father doesn't make the pain or the agony go away. But his response is to pray more earnestly. Let's continue reading. So after he says this, he said, it's, the scripture says that there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and the sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. What does he do, though? He doesn't run away he doesn't fall away. He doesn't try to escape the pain. He doesn't try to escape the suffering, yet he submits to it. He dives deeper. He prays more earnestly, Scripture says. Man, man, oh man, oh man, we serve a God who is faithful, and Jesus understands that the truth that God is the rock. He is the trustworthy one. He is where you run to when life is great, when life is terrible. He is the rock. He understands. So since we serve a God who understands, what does that mean for us? Well, my friend, since he's been here before, he understands it. That means we can put a trust in God. We can put trust in Christ. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart trusts. Another Psalm of David. Isn't it interesting to see the different parallels of David in different seasons of life, just like ours? See, we trust God because Scripture says to. And that is, the, and that is the, uh, the most important thing because Scripture says it, but yet Scripture is also backed up with evidence. Like, it's also backed up in my life and in some of y'all's life when you see the faithfulness of God, when you see that tr God is truly trustworthy. We, we trust God because he is faithful. God has never left me or forsaken me, even in the struggles of life. Now, do I, if, you, if you have kids in the room, I don't, uh, one day, but if you have kids in the room, and if you remember the first time you had a kid, and you're like, I ain't got a clue what's going on. This little child is dependent upon me, and I don't know what to do with it. And, and so what you search out people around you who have been where you are, who have, who have walked the life, who have been a new parent before, and you listen to them, and you seek understanding, and you trust their advice. Why? Because they've been there and they've done it. Christ has been here and he's done it. So we can trust him. So what's next? What's next is we submit to Christ. Now, notice in Psalm 69, so if you read that whole chapter, David is continuing on in, in, in the same vein of, Lord, I need you, I'm tired, I'm weary, I'm exhausted. But then he he's kind of flips the script on us a little bit. And then he says this. He says this, but as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. So he's praying all of this stuff, but yet he comes back and says, at an acceptable time, O God. Like he's submitting back to the time, the timeliness of, of, the, of the Father. He's going back and saying, Lord, but you're God, I'm not, I trust you right? He is submitting his will to the Father. Now, now, get this, we can't submit without one important factor, without humility. But don't worry, because if you ever go through suffering, especially great suffering, <laughs> let me tell you, suffering does a phenomenal job at humbling a person. See, 
when I was 11 years old, I had a surgery. And this surgery, they said that my hips and all my legs were all kind of jacked up, and I really just need a, an, a realignment on my legs. And so my legs was growing, my right side of my leg was growing to like over here, and then my left leg was growing over here, but the bottom half was growing to my right side. It was all kinds of messed up. And so the solution was, let's just break both of his hips, twist them a little bit, and put it back together. What a great idea. And it, it, it is, but as an 11-year-old kid, I'm like, that doesn't make any bit of sense at all. So while they did that, they took an inch of bone out of my right hip and they put it in my left ankle. And then they did something with a scalpel on my left calf muscle. I pretty much think they just cut the mark and just said they did it so they could charge more money. I don't know what they did, but can I tell you that the recovery process was absolutely terrible. Because what I was capable of before the surgery, I was no longer capable of. Right, it was embarrassing. I was an 11-year-old kid, and I now had to have my parents help to use the restroom. Like, that's not fun, and that's very humbling, even at 11 years old, right? So it does a great job, suffering does a great job at humbling a person. See, not only do we need to be reliant upon Christ, in our, because when it, let me just say this, when we, when we become humble, when we have all these sufferings and we're now humble because of it, we tend to, our pride tends to creep up on itself because we feel so insecure. We're like, oh my gosh, I, I, people can't see me the way I am. And so when people are around to help, we, we reject their help. And so we not only be reliant upon Christ, especially in these moments, but we also need to allow other people to come in and help. Because I don't know how many times that I'm like, oh, this is embarrassing. I don't, want, I don't need your help. But yet, maybe this is the word for some, that we need to remove the pride even in our insecurities and just allow someone to come help. Because we've been praying, Lord, I need you. And God's probably like, you goober. I've sent you people to help. But you keep rejecting them. So don't reject the help, especially in your time of need, simply because you're prideful. But see, once, once we are humble, then we can submit to God. And you're like, well, why do I submit to God? Because so, he's been here before. He understands. Christ understands. And let me tell you, he's a much better author of my life than I am. So we trust him and we submit to him. But we have to be humble first. So we trust him, we submit to him, then what's next? We obey him. Well, that's a fun word. <laughs> no one likes to obey anything, all right? We do what we're asked, and we're doers of the word, even in suffering. And we can look at Paul's life for this. Now, yes, I know Paul is, is this guy who was suffering for, the, for Christ's sake, for the gospel's sake. And you're like, in America, we don't suffer for the gospel a whole lot. And you would be right. We don't. But yet the, the, the point still stands that even through suffering, Paul still chose to obey. See, don't let suffering become an excuse not to serve Christ. Don't, don't let suffering become an excuse to be like, well, maybe, maybe when I get better, or maybe after the season. No, no, no. In fact, a question should be asked, Lord, how do you want me to use me? How, what do you want to do and use my life even in the season of suffering? How might you want to use me? Because guess what? I serve a God that, whose, whose scripture says that he uses all things for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. So if you're a Christian here today and you're experiencing suffering, God can use it for your good and his good and to glorify his name. So don't, so don't back out on serving God and obeying him when suffering comes because you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do? You keep doing stuff. Now, yes, I understand certain suffering causes you not to be able to serve like you used to. But you still find a way to obey Christ. You obey him because he's been here, he knows it, he understands. And see, when I think about this, I, I obeying, I I kind of think of, honestly, I think of Pastor Bill. Because, like, if you know his story, I, I believe you shared your testimony on stage or right around here a few weeks ago. But, like, he had a wreck. Did he ask for this wreck? No. Did he want it? No. Would he, would he rather be at work all the time right now and doing stuff and making money and supporting his family? Yes. But suffering came and knocked on his front door without his permission because suffering never asked for permission. And so now he's, he's, sitting, he's sitting here, and he's like, and he has one or two options. He can be like, I'm done, I, I, whatever, I can serve the Lord when I'm, when I'm back and walking and, and ready to go. Or he can allow God to use his suffering to glorify his name. He has a privilege of probably going to physical and occupational therapy once or twice, maybe even three times a week. What an opportunity to be in a place that he wouldn't be otherwise unless he was suffering. And then he can bring his name. How, you might ask. 
Well, Pastor Bill can go in there smiling even when they know he's a, they're going to make him stand up and it's going to be extremely painful. They start, this therapist starts realizing, man, Pastor Bill, he's smiling when he comes in. Why? <laughs> Pastor Bill, when we stand him up and to walk, he prays instead of cussing me out like other clients do. Now, this is interesting. What kind of God that he serves that, that this God of his gives him permission and gives the ability to be happy and joyful in the midst of suffering? I want to know more about that God, right? You just see in that little scenario how God can use suffering to glorify his name. So how might God want to use your suffering, if you're going through it right now, to glorify his name? We obey because he understands. Next is this, is we abide. Now, I get it, I put this as the last thing, but we abide. But that's not, it's not the least of them. Actually, I would say all other three, the, the, the trusting, the submitting, and the obeying, actually come fall underneath the abiding. Because if we don't abide, then we won't do any of those. So we must abide. And we see in Scripture that Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Without me, you can't do anything. Right? So we know we must stay connected to the vine. See, it's in the abiding that we find rest. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest, Jesus says. For my yoke is easy, easy and my burden is light. Right? This is the, this is the promise of, of Jesus. So what do we do? We abide. We stay in the presence of God, and we find rest for our souls when life doesn't seem to be very restful. See, see, see we, not only that, but I, I picture it like this. So we come to God, and we ask all these questions. God, why? Where are you? What are you doing? This is painful. I thought you said uh, you, there would be rainbows and butterflies. Well, if you, if, you, if you don't know, the Bible actually doesn't promise rainbows and butterflies. Instead, it promises suffering. Isn't that so joyful? But that's okay, because we have one who understands, who's been here and done that. So I think of it like this, so we're going and asking questions, and, and, and then we're like, and then we won't shut up because we're trying, we're like, God, I can't hear you. Yeah, because we keep mouthing everything, you know? We keep talking and talking, and we won't let him get a chance to respond. So finally, when we take a breath, it's almost like the Holy Spirit comes and gives you a hug and whispers in your ear, child, I love you. Trust me. And immediately you realize that the, that the Holy Spirit is real and, and the Lord is, loves you and that I'm actually seen and heard and that I'm not alone in the universe. I, there is a God and he loves me. And then you can rest in that because we have a Lord who understands. And then, and then abiding is a place where we find peace. We find peace because, because we just... It's not, upon our, it's not incumbent upon ourselves to do anything else. It's not, it's not incumbent upon ourselves to find the answers and find the solutions. Know in the craziness of life we can find peace because all we have to do is this. Trust, submit, obey, and abide. We can, we can have peace because that's all we're called to do. And all the other stuff, let the Lord lead you. Let the chips fall where they may and, let, and pray that the Lord guides those chips, Right? You know, it's like, it's just, just, just you trust, you submit, you obey, and you abide. And, l- and let me note this for people who are like, well, I'm actually not suffering, Zach, so this kind of sermon is like not for me today. Well, guess what? I got a secret to, for you. It's not much of a secret. It's in the Bible. Thousands of people and millions of people have a Bible. You can read it anytime you want. Please do. But see, suffer, the same things you do in suffering, the trusting the submitting, the obeying, and the abiding, you do the exact same thing when the suffering is not upon you yet. In fact, it's critical to do all those things before the suffering comes because you know how hard it is to build a foundation in the storm? Ah, but if you do these things, you build the foundation upon which to stand, which is Christ, and then when you come to these storms, you're like, oh, I'm a, a little, you know, like, uh, you know, oh, I'm sh- shaking a little bit, but I'm not fallen. I have not fallen. I have not come to the end of my rope because I have built the foundation upon which to stand. So we do the same things. So if you're not suffering, don't tune out. You do the exact same things in suffering or without suffering. Now, you might be like this. What do I, how do I abide? And, and, and that's a good question because that's, abiding is kind of a Christianese word. You know, it's like, what is abiding? It means, it means staying connected to, staying, staying under. It means staying in the presence of. 
So, so what do we do? We, we stay connected to the vine. We stay in the presence of God. Well, how do you do that? Because that seems real spiritual. And some people are like, I'm not real spiritual, so I'm, trying to, I'm going to make it real practical for you. You see this right here? You start opening, opening it up, and you start reading it. And, and you read whatever you, you're doing. If it's a few verses, it's a few chapters. If I'm trying to read a Bible, the Bible in a year right now, and so it's several chapters and verses, and so I try to do that. But you don't just read it just to mark it off the list like you did it, although I've been guilty of that more times than I can account, even recently. But you read it, and you, and you ask yourself, what is the Scripture trying to communicate, and what is, try, what is God trying to communicate to His Word? And then you try to apply it to your life for that day, and then, and, and then you do that each day. And, and then not only do you read, read God's Word, but you start praying. And praying is not just bringing your laundry list to God, although it can be at times. See, see we learn how to pray in Scripture, and, and, we, and, you, know, and, and you, know, you know, the Lord's Prayer, all of all that, and that's great. We should copy that. But yet, so one thing I realize in that prayer is it starts out giving honor and praise to the Lord. To the Lord. And there's sometimes in my life where I'm like, I just, like, I'm driving down the road. Or I'm just sitting in my dorm room, and I'm like, I serve a great God. And, like, I, I'm just reminded randomly of the goodness of God and that he loves me, and he didn't have to. Like, how awesome of a thing that is. That I, do I truly believe that? Like, the God of the universe cares about a little ant like me? Yes, I do. And so I start saying, Lord, I love you. Lord, I'm grateful for you. And, I start, and that's my prayer is just, I love you. It's not, it's not a request of God. It's just honoring and worshiping in a prayer. What I often love to say, if you read in Revelations, the elders in the throne room of God cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And that's a prayer that I pray all the time. And I can say that forever because it's so true. And so you, so you pray, and then, yes, when you have a laundry list of stuff, it is not, it's okay to, to pray that at times, but make sure that's not just all that you're praying because it's not, it's not a gimme, gimme, gimme kind of thing. No, it's, abiding is a relationship. And what a good is a relationship if it's all gimme, gimme, gimme and not, hey, what can I give to you, Lord? And then, and then I worship, and I, and then I worship things like this, especially in suffering, whatever comes to my mind. But when I was preparing for the sermon, I was like, I thought of this song. Lord, I love you. And I just said, I can't really sing too well, but I'm like, Jesus, I love you. And oh, how I love you. And I just start singing that, especially in the times when life and the storms around me, because sometimes I can't feel the love. You know? And that's normal. And like, it's so normal, but the love is still there. So I sing that, I, I worship, reminding myself that I am loved. I, God does see me, and he understands what I'm going through. So that's the practicality of it. So we serve a high priest, and I'm closing, so we're about to get out of here. But we serve a high priest who sympathizes with us, like Scripture says. Right, he, that Hebrew verse is so amazing. It's so out of relief because we serve a God who's been here and who's done it. He knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like just in, the, just in that garden, just in that one picture. He knows what it's like to trust God. He knows what it's like to submit to him and to his will. He knows what it's like to obey. And he knows what it's like to abide. Because, oh, oh let, did you know that abiding is not always rainbows and sunshines? Like if you go back to, and, 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 and a matter of fact, let's just do it because why not? Because we have the time. When we go back to this and we read this, it says this, that there appeared to him an angel strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Did you know that he was abiding, but he was still feeling agony? Like agony, yes, can feel very peaceful and feel restful as we were just talking about, but abiding does, in, in this times of suffering can feel very, very much like agony and pain because you're just, you're in the midst of it. But watch, watch what happened. There was an angel there strengthening him. The Holy Spirit strengthens us when we go through that. So the abiding can look very di different in different seasons of life, but it, yet it's still abiding. So Christ knows what it's like to trust. He knows what it's like to submit. He knows what it's like to obey. He knows what it's like to abide. And if the Savior of the world had to do those things, we can too. Let's pray. Lord, we love you.